Well, I was remiss earlier in not extending a warm greeting to all of our brothers and sisters who are live streaming with us this morning. I'm looking directly at the camera and saying, good morning. <laughs> I know all the rest of the congregation here gathered uh, joins with me in expressing a warm greeting to all of you that are watching us on the internet. And for those of you that are traveling this summer, there's a word for you. You may always live stream the 930 service uh, by going to our website, and it's very easy to find, and there you go. So, Well, our message for this morning is the third installment in our July uh, preaching series, Living Well, A Mentor's Last Words. Uh, during these weeks, we are considering what is generally agreed to be the Apostle Paul's last letter, 2 Timothy. This letter contains Paul's final words to his young protege, Timothy. Written from a Roman prison cell, Paul's words are from beginning to end words of encouragement. Encouragement for Timothy, but encouragement for you and for me as well. So let's turn now to our passage for today from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 8 through 13. And together, let's listen for God to speak. Paul writes, Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of David. That is my gospel, for which I suffer hardship, even to the point of being chained like a criminal. But the word of God is not chained. Therefore, I endure everything for the sake of the elect, so that they may also obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. The saying is sure. If we have died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, indeed. Garth Callahan is known as the napkin notes dad. Garth Callahan is also dying. When his daughter Emma was 12 years of age, Garth received devastating news from his physician. He had metastatic cancer and had roughly an 8% chance of surviving five years. Well, after absorbing this rather shocking news, Callahan decided that he wanted to leave something behind that would help his daughter remember him after he was gone. And so he vowed to write Emma 826 notes, each containing one or two lines of encouragement or wisdom. Every day a note was written on a paper napkin which would be placed in her lunch bag. You see, if Callahan wrote 826 notes, he would ensure that Emma would receive one note from him every day until she graduated from high school, even if he wasn't around to write them himself. Callahan's notes to Emma were always brief, just one or two lines. They ranged from words uh, written by Gandhi and Dr. Seuss and Mr. Rogers and all the sages. One day, he simply wrote, be yourself. I love you just how God created you. Love, Dad. When he was asked why he wrote the notes, Callahan said this. He said, this is really about leaving a legacy so that Emma can understand some of my life philosophies and how much I loved her. I don't know what the future holds for me, now is the time to share what I've learned. I don't know what the future holds for me. Now is the time to share what I've learned. I wonder if that wasn't the way the Apostle Paul was feeling as he wrote his last words to Timothy. You see, in no small measure, 2 Timothy feels like a series of napkin notes of encouragement from Paul to Timothy. Paul's second letter to Timothy doesn't feel like a sustained or well-organized or well-crafted argument as much as it feels like 
a series of brief, almost stream of consciousness exhortations and encouragements from Paul as he ruminates about life and ministry in a cold Roman prison cell. But there is a sense of urgency, as Paul writes, roughly in the years 66 or 67. He knows that his time on earth is short. The end is drawing near. There's no time to waste. Paul is concerned about the well-being of the young churches during this time of persecution under Nero. Paul writes to urge Timothy to guard the gospel, to persevere in it, to keep on preaching it, and, if necessary, to suffer for it. And so Paul sends a crucial napkin note to bolster Timothy, a note recorded in our opening verse of the text for this morning. Remember Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, a descendant of David. That is my gospel. Remember Jesus Christ. In the original language of our text, the phrase is best rendered, keep on remembering Jesus Christ. Now, we're all used to hearing speakers say, now, if you only remember one thing that I say today, remember this. Well, with these words of verse 8, that's pretty much what Paul is saying to Timothy. Timothy, if you only remember one thing that I write in this letter, really, if you remember this one thing beyond all of my letters, keep on remembering Jesus, Jesus Christ. When Paul calls Timothy to keep remembering Jesus, understand that he's not merely suggesting to have pleasant thoughts or memories of Jesus every now and again, the same way that we might call to mind a long-forgotten friend. No, Paul's words are written in the present imperative, And they have a life or death feel to them. Paul says, continually remember Jesus. Persist in looking to Jesus. Your life now and in the future depends on it. Clearly, Paul had staked his life on Jesus. And he emphatically states that Jesus Christ, raised from the dead, descendant of David is his gospel, his good news, his hope in life and ultimately in death. This is the gospel that had been entrusted to Paul and it is the gospel that he wanted to pass on, the good news he wanted to pass on to Timothy. In essence, Paul is saying to Timothy, I don't have any sage advice to offer you in the thick of these difficult and anxious times. No, I don't have seven steps for how to endure hardship. What I do have to offer is a person, Jesus Christ. That is my gospel. You see, friends, Paul reminds us that the gospel is not fundamentally a series of intellectual propositions. The gospel is not fundamentally doctrinal assertions or theological principles. No, the gospel is not a religious system. The gospel is not even a message about how people may be saved. The gospel is a person who saves. The gospel is a person, Jesus, raised from the dead, our Lord, who saves. Paul wants us to remember and to keep on remembering this gospel truth because, frankly, we seem so often to forget, to forget that this is what it's all about. This is the one truth, my friends, that really matters. Shortly before leaving a church where he had served as pastor for some nine years in Burlington, Vermont, 
Martin Copenhaver was challenged by a question that was posed in the context of a denominational pastor's gathering. This was the question. When was the last time you told your congregation what Jesus means to you? Well, this question was on Copenhaver's mind as he crafted his final sermon for this congregation in Burlington, Vermont. He entitled the sermon, What It's All About. And this is how he concluded the sermon, and I quote, As I'm about to leave, there is something I want to tell you. I want to tell you what Jesus means to me. I want to share my belief that everything depends on him. I want to urge you to learn from him. I want to assure you that you can lean on him in times of trouble. I want to ask you to listen to his words of challenge. I want to tell you that I believe that you can entrust your life to him. I want to affirm that he is Lord of this church and that in his name you are freed to love one another, and empowered to share that love with a hurting world. I want to profess that though once people could not look at the face of God and live, now we are invited to look at the face of God in him, in Jesus, and live as we have never lived before. He is Emmanuel. God with us, God with us all, whether we are together or whether we are apart. That's what it's all about. That's all I know. Amen. And thus ended his sermon. Well, at the conclusion of the sermon, Copenhaver did what all of us preachers do. He went to the back door to greet his people for one final time. One woman who is a beloved saint of the church was so overcome with emotion that when she reached him in the greeting line, she, she couldn't continue. She went to the back of the line and started over again. <laughs> Copenhaver assumed that she simply did not know how to say goodbye to him. When she finally reached him again, she extended her hand. And with tears in her eyes and a cracking voice, she looked him in the eye and she asked, why didn't you tell us this before? <laughs> Can I just say that I hope never to have that question directed to me? You see, friends, every week when we come to this place to worship, did you realize that we are engaging in an act of remembering? Remembering Jesus Christ raised from the dead, descendant of David. And it's my call, and Mark's call, and Greg's call, as ministers of the gospel, to preach Jesus, who is the gospel. We have been entrusted with this message, and we are called to faithfully pass it on to you. It is all that matters. In my desk here at the office, I keep a tattered three by five card on which years ago, I wrote a quote from a book on preaching that I must tell you changed my world. And this quote has become my measuring rod. It's a measuring rod that I put up against every sermon that I preach. So here's the quote. Do not write one more word of one more sermon until you have found something big and true to say. Do not stand in a pulpit ever again unless you intend to speak of what is large, the fruit of good seeing and thinking and with some urgency. 
And every time I come to this place to preach, I pull out that tattered three by five card and I remind myself of what it's all about. Because like Paul, I do have something big and true and large to say today. Keep remembering Jesus Christ, raised from the dead and descendant of David. It is my gospel. It is your gospel. It is our gospel. As he sat in a prison cell near the end of World War II, German Lutheran martyr Dietrich Bonhoeffer once offered these rather profound insights about preaching the gospel. He wrote, Preaching is more than the artful conveyance of useful information. More than instruction in sound doctrine, preaching enables the risen Christ to walk among his people. Friends, I trust that the risen Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, is walking among us today in this sanctuary just as he walked among the people of God as they worshiped in the time of Paul and Timothy. And just as the risen Christ spoke words of encouragement and exhortation in the midst of first century suffering and hardship, Jesus is here this morning to speak to us. As our passage for this morning affirms the word of God cannot be chained. The word of God cannot be contained. The word of God made flesh. Jesus, in his risen power, cannot be contained. Amen? Amen. He is here this morning and he is speaking to you and to me. A few years ago, the magazine, The Christian Century, put out a challenge, and they asked 23 distinguished Christian pastors, theologians, and writers to try their hand at summarizing the gospel of Jesus Christ. But the kicker was they could only use a maximum of seven words. (sighs) That's like torture for a preacher. Come on. But it was truly interesting to see what Christian proclamation boils down to when the person is put on the spot and can only use a very few words. Well, here is the gospel in seven words according to some of those who were invited to respond. Here's the first one. God, through Jesus Christ, welcomes you anyway. Another. In Christ, God's yes defeats our no. Another. Once dead, now alive, Christ reshaping people. How about one more? Christ offers new life for all. Good. All of these formulations of the gospel have merit. But here's my absolute favorite. And there is poetic justice in this because it was written by Martin Copenhaver, the minister of whom I spoke earlier. And here's what he wrote. God gets the last word. God gets the last word. This is how he explains his summary of the gospel. In the death and resurrection of Jesus, it is clear that our God is the kind of God who insists on having the last word. To be sure, the second to last word, which can be very powerful, can be given to something else. Despair, estrangement, hurt, evil, even death. But our God insists on having the very last word. And that is always a word of hope, of reconciliation, of healing, of goodness, 
of life. Friends, this morning I trust by the agency of the Holy Spirit that the risen Christ is walking among us right now, right here in this place. Many of us have come here today carrying our own unique hurts, pains, losses, hardships. Our present tense experiences of despair, estrangement, hurt, evil, and maybe even death. These are very real. They are very present realities of that, I am sure. But I am also very sure that our risen Christ insists on having the last word. And if you'll listen, he is coming alongside you even now and speaking to you and speaking to me just as he spoke life-giving words of encouragement to Paul and to Timothy and so many others who've come before us. Can you hear him? Keep on listening. Keep on remembering Jesus. And of this you can be sure. He will remember you. And may it be so that all honor and glory may be given to the one who has been revealed to us as maker, most blessed redeemer, and friend. Amen? Amen. May it be so.